Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate the opportunity and you connecting me with these magical humans. And um, Jen, you know, I think what I am mainly concerned about is higher education not keeping up pace with what's happening in the industry because dinosaurs are teaching these classes. They haven't actively all been involved in industry or they're not all actively in production right now. So the whole idea is to have a conversation between industry, faculty and students, right? And I really think faculty is the missing key. It's the missing conversation because so many faculty will be invited to this event. And it's not just faculty, it's program leaders, department chairs, deans. These are folks who control job descriptions, hiring, you know, um, so that higher education can actually be a reflection of what the industry needs and where it's going, you know. Huh, do we really need to hire somebody with, you know, who's written 17 books on the theory of silent film? Like, do we really need that? No, we probably need somebody who um, can be nimble and adapt current practices in the industry and translate those into the classroom. Why? So that our students can have skills that are relevant to the workforce today. So in terms of production, um, I think it would just be really helpful to faculty like myself, who will be putting together new forms of our classes over the summer. We're gonna take the information that we acquire at these conferences and redesign our curriculum. So we know that, for example, at most Cal State schools, which by the way, I run the Cal State Entertainment Alliance. And so we help 23 campuses in our system. Um, more meaningfully connected with the entertainment industry so we can have these types of conversations so we can teach relevant shit, not, you know, stuff that doesn't matter, right. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, you know? No, no, that makes sense. And it's definitely something we've heard over time. Like it's not, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I used to work in education at Autodesk and we had the same, the same problems, the same, there you go. the same struggle. And the farther out you go, you know, if you have the really specialized schools that, that hire from production, you know, the farther out you go in terms of how close you are to that epicenter, all the way up to high schools, the, far, the, the bigger the disconnect can be. Um, and there's a whole, a whole bunch of reasons around that, including access to technology, access to hardware. That's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges, I think, from my perspective that schools face is being able to keep up with the latest developments in hardware and software, which is really challenging. It's a huge obstacle. You're absolutely correct. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is, okay, as we're thinking about this hybrid model now of going back to campus, I've been fully vaccinated. Most faculty members in production are probably gonna be fully vaccinated. So we'll be probably going back to campus, which thank God, because we've all been trying to teach from our living rooms um, when we have no cameras and we have no studios. And it's been a nightmare for everybody, of course, but you know, in the context of higher ed, right? So. I think the real takeaway is how do we continually disrupt our education models, our curriculum and our classes? What can we learn from the industry this summer that we can like take into our classes in the fall uh, and make it work? Like I'll give you a very niche example. I teach broadcast news that's my bread and butter it's my professional background that's what I studied <laughs> did you really Where? I studied journalism at, at Concordia University in Montreal yes Concordia yeah. has an awesome program I mean lucky, I'm so old when lucky we did girl it. we were cutting we were cutting radio tape oh girl <laughs> you can grow your nails you have to use the razor I know we weren't even allowed know. to use the editorial software it had to be an editor because it was so fancy and we didn't know how to use it <laughs> So I oversaw <laughs> the digital transition at the BBC World Service radio from tape to um, digital awesome. audio editing. And like out of um, maybe six producers, four of them quit because oh, okay. they were like 80 years old and they should have gone anyway. But they were just like, we can't do this computer stuff. This is it. We're leaving. <laughs> but anyway, um, so in news, 
uh, now keep in mind it's spring uh, and I have I have no cameras to check out because we haven't figured out a bloody sanitizing protocol for our equipment. And two, we're locked out of our studios. So how do we produce a newscast? So as a professor, I'm like, yes, but the show must go on and it will. And so I quickly had to learn a virtual switcher platform, TVU uh, network was the name of the software, learned it over spring break. And I was like, we're gonna do a live newscast and you're gonna put your phones on a tripod and then we're gonna have a director and there's, we're just gonna switch between your phones and we're gonna do it live. And we got it done. And I just got a text from a student who had used that material in his portfolio reel and got a job in Odessa, Texas. So I'm like, it worked, it worked. I transferred <laughs> skills in a pandemic. I did my job, like I do, I, my job is done when my students get jobs. That is the desired outcome. It's the desired takeaway of anything that comes out of my mouth, right? So in terms of this panel, what do faculty need to know as they are retooling their curriculum, right? For a hybrid situation where not all students are going to be back on campus, right? So this is going to be a really interesting scenario. And it's likely what's happening in the industry as well, right? You have the post-production that's going to still probably work from home. We're going to be shifting all of our practices, right? And so let's have that conversation and see what that might look like in a higher ed context. Does no, that that's, help? That totally <laughs> helps. Oh, um, right. The title makes me nervous because I don't think, I think that's too too specific like virtual production is just one thing um, yeah. so what I do is I popped in something else um Tell that me. it's a panel that we did oh, I love it now you can tweak it a bit more because it doesn't necessarily have to be global but that was a panel right. that our CEO chaired um earlier this That's year a, for a conference really good one and it was a little bit of everything right it was cloud it was virtual production it was it was techniques it was um you know it, I think there's so much in terms of what, like everyone, we all need to learn. No one knows what a post-pandemic world is going to look like, right? None of us know once we're out of this, whatever that looks like, how do we interact? How do we interact with people? How do we interact with our customers? How do we, how do we learn? Are we, are we all going to be like throwing away our headsets because nobody ever wants to look at a Zoom logo again? Or has this become part of our daily life? Um, what do you do with kids that can't go to campus who are going to have to work from home or study from home because of still being at risk. You know, the, the pandemic's not going to magically end. I don't think when we all get a shot, as far as I understand, I don't know. I, what do I know? I'm not a, I can't even say what they do and, and can't even say the special disease <laughs> medical term for it. But um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of stuff. I mean, for Foundry, but like I am not a technology wizard. So I'm a little bit apprehensive. I told this to Kevin, um, it's open source. Yep. That's another one. Oh, we're, we're freezing. I hope you guys can hear me. Okay. I see you moving yeah, again. I can still hear you. We I just lost you your video. Moving. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I just turned off my video because it seemed like it was chugging. Either Kevin's super still or no he's frozen. I can't tell. <laughs> oh, no, he's not. He's moving. <laughs> okay. Did he's you? not frozen. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think I just want to be cautious because I'm not going to be able to go in there and say this is exactly what's happening in production because I'm not an expert. I can get the talking points about how we're seeing our tools have to adapt to a new reality. We need to look at our tools and make them more cloud accessible. Our licensing has to be more accessible than the old style. What did we do to adapt just offering licenses to schools? We used to sell schools licenses to schools who installed them in their labs. Well, that's not a model that's working. So we had to adapt even our licensing model um, as we're working towards a cloud. I'm going to write my own notes down. So I know I have to talk to you, talk about. So it's everything from cloud-based licensing. Um, file sharing becomes really important. Being able to navigate file sharing in the cloud. Um, the virtual production is a component of filmmaking in terms of how do you reduce the amount of people on set? How do you reduce travel and location-based filming? Because that's that's very hard to do these days um, and that's where the virtual production techniques come in but it's only one part of what does a post-pandemic world look like in in filmmaking and animation and, 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 and if i if i can um i really think jennifer is a perfect person for kind of aggregating efforts efforts among a lot of the people who are trying to figure out 
what can we do collaboratively to put together best case of all things becoming physical again, students, cameras, everything back in the classrooms, because she is the outreach person for the ASWF. And I think the narrative for, for me is that there is What's a- What's the ASWF, sorry? What is that? The, so, the Academy of Software Foundation. Ah, so basically what it is, it's technologies yes. that are shared. And, they, and I've learned a lot. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. so 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 I, I met Jennifer through the Academy's diversity initiative. And we were just doing Zooms and, you know, um, all of the things that I was learning about their mantra was that they were trying to um, provide some opportunity for people in the educational to workforce to understand the whole concept of open source and collaboration. And what I thought was really powerful is I went to the site and I saw all these different companies who were competing in a normal world against each other, but all had decided to, you know, kind of band together. So that's what I saw. And I, I know that, you know, Jennifer's company is, as well as, you know, 20 or 30 other, other ones are kind of in there trying to figure out different solutions. So that's the kind of mantra that I thought that would be very important to any of the panels because there's, everybody's gonna come up with a different way to figure out how to leverage or to exploit what they think is a solution to the marketplace. And I like the things that Jennifer has, has shared with me about how, again, we've got to come up with, you know, it's not a one size fits all, but we can at least agree that there's probably a need for collaboration more now than ever. So that's the spirit in which I'm thinking that she could be a person who could represent not just Adobe or Dolby or Warner Media or any of the other companies that are sponsoring the summit, but people who, who really want to figure out what they can do to um, become a missing piece of the puzzle. So that was, and, and I, 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 okay. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am going to. I asked, I asked Dina to give me her definition of virtual production. And every time I ask people what virtual production is, they give me a very um, logical explanation that it's just doing things virtually, remotely, mm. without being physically connected. And Jennifer, if you can, can you give Dina, because I kind of fumbled a little yes yesterday, but can you give the definition of virtual production and how, and how it applies to open source and possibly to found? Uh, okay. It, um, so I'm going to have to um, course correct you a little bit on the definition, Kevin. See, um, I... Virtual production isn't what it sounds like in terms of the literal definition. Um, it's not everyone working virtually. What, what virtual production really is, and this is something we're going to have to be a little bit careful with. I saw one of your other potential speakers um, coming at it from the virtual production point of view. But what virtual production is doing, um, and the companies that are really pushing for it are coming from the games industry. And what it is, is it's doing things in real time. So you can see, um, you can see, so I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling over my words. So you can see the results a lot quicker. You have quicker iter iterations. So what that means is you're making a movie, right? In the old days, two years ago, <laughs> three years ago, you film, you film different scenes, you film different things, you've got all kinds of equipment, you've got cranes, you know, you want to do a shot, you need certain lighting, you're outside, you're filming, let's say you go outside of LA in the desert, you have a specific amount of time to get this shot. What virtual production allows you to do is do all that work on a stage. So they're building these giant LED stages, um, all the major post-production facilities are creating these huge LED walls that are massive, like picture, picture, uh, sadly, RIP Arclight Cinema, but you know, the giant screens and the, and the dome screens. And they, what they do is they're able to use this screen, film the actors on set, interacting with practical, um, practical elements like a glass, like the actor is going to have a glass and behind him, instead of my somewhat messy office, um, 
they're filming on a on a wall. So in the old days, they used to film on green screen, and then they would do it all in post production, and they would fill in the background. Now they're able to do they're able to put the background behind them, so the director can see me in my messy office. But let's say they want to change the lighting because the day is getting longer. They can adjust all the lights on the on the backdrop. Um, they don't need to be in the desert. You don't need to go to Joshua Tree. You can have Joshua Tree right behind you on stage. So what it's doing is it's allowing productions like if you watch a show like Mandalorian they were able to shoot this show which you know if you look at the old Star Wars they're shot in Morocco they're shot all over the place all over the world to get those like Tatooine type backgrounds where Mandalorian was shot all on this stage because it was alien planet and they were able to recreate the idea that the, the designers had in their head so it's allowing productions to happen um without having to be on location and saving money because you don't have to be beholden to the time of day, for example. Um, and I will get much more examples and better, better descriptions when I am doing this live in front of all these people. Um, but this is just one part, right? Because not every project lends itself well to virtual production. Some, some production, it depends on what your production is.